Our text for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost is Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. This pericope is frequently referred to as Jesus stilling or Jesus calming the storm. And it has parallel text then also in uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27, then also Mark, or excuse me, Luke 8, verses 22 to 25. The text points to the person of Jesus and his saving activity. And as we examine the text, we'll note also Old Testament parallels with Jonah and with Moses, because certainly Jesus' actions in this text would bring these Old Testament characters to the mind and cause them, cause his hearers to ask the question, who is this? Bell's commentary on Mark in the Concordia commentary series was very helpful in unpacking certain aspects of this pericope. We want to make sure we give credit where credit's due here. So going to verse 35, beginning here, we've got the Kai Legai Altois. Oops. We'll just try that. Kai Legai Altois. Uh, and he said to them, the he here is Jesus, and them are his disciples. Not the crowds, but the disciples. So he's addressing his disciples, and he says to them, let's go. Oh, let's see. This is uh, apparently toward the close of the day after all of the, the uh, talking and uh, such. And he says, let's go to the other, the other side or cross over, in this case, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it's actually, the, I believe, the first crossing of the Sea of Galilee in the, the Gospel of Mark. There will be more to follow, but... Uh, and this will take him over, when he crosses the Sea of Galilee from this point, he'll be over in then the land or the uh, country of the Gentile area of the Gerizines, I believe it was. Yeah, the Gerizines where the healing of the demon-possessed man will take place, and that's in chapter 5 of Mark. So verse 36, then, we uh, offend us, we leave, to leave or to dismiss the crowd. So he is separating now himself and his disciples from the crowd. And then the... Uh, the uh, the paralambano no sin. They meaning the disciples. They take him, I mean they take Jesus, and away from the crowds they take him along. So they take Jesus into the boat which they have uh, kept available, just as Jesus asked them to. You may remember this from Mark chapter three verse nine. Uh, for fear of the crowds or being crushed by the crowds, Jesus basically had a boat or had them keep a boat available for him. So they get into this boat and they begin their journey across the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and it says, and this is an interesting part of the text that's, that's a little, uh, if I can find it, and all the other boats with them. Somewhere there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so all the, uh, yeah, all the boats with them. This is kind of interesting because this is the only place the other boats are mentioned. We don't hear about them ever again. But all these other boats, you know, with the storm coming up, it, it begs some questions. It's very likely, though, that that these other people and the crowd and everything attempted to follow Jesus and whatever boats were available there for them. I mean, certainly we have examples of other places in Scripture where the crowds would run along or around the shore of the lake to get to where Jesus was heading. If there are boats, they would then most likely get in those boats and follow, attempt to follow Christ wherever he was going. That apparently is where all of these, uh, these boats come in. But when the storm arises, we get no mention of the boats again. And since Jesus had dismissed the, the crowds, it's most likely that the storm and the calming 
of the storm were events that were meant exclusively for the disciples and for their instruction. Sort of like we read as, we are, as he talks about parables. He tells the crowd the parables, but he takes the disciples aside for a little extra uh, instruction about these parables. Uh, here Christ is also separating again his disciples from the crowd to give them some extra instruction, in this case so with a rather large object lesson. So what that means, of course, is that Jesus planned the storm for a specific purpose, the teaching and the strengthening of the disciples' faith. So verse 37, we begin here, Lelox, here with the, uh, is a word that denotes, if you will, very violent, intense, weather activity, so you have a, a great, a violent windstorm. The Sea of Galilee, geographically, is surrounded by uh, pretty high hills, and that makes it susceptible to these sudden and very uh, frequently violent uh, storms. So it's not unusual for a storm like that to hit there. And it's interesting that the disciples, who were fishermen, who were accustomed to being aware of and being ready for these violent storms did not apparently have any any indication or any clue that one was coming or that uh, let's just say the weather forecast looked good but again Jesus had determined that this storm that he would be in charge of that he would bring about would be used to teach them, so he, in a sense, set them up for all of this. For this, uh, this wasn't Jesus taking advantage of a storm that just happened to show up. We think we need to think in terms of Jesus bringing the storm into being, in order that he might teach them and strengthen them in their faith. So he especially set this thing up for the disciples. Oh, so we look at verse 38 then. The stern, the, the uh, pr prumain, prumain, the stern of the boat. From the best way we understand these things, you know, we had uh, a galleon fishing boat discovered, I think it was in 1986, that uh, they found during low, some low water times there, pretty well preserved. And uh, first of all, the, the boat was large enough for Jesus and his 12, all 12 disciples to be in. But also there's this idea, there's a, like a platform that's uh, built over the stern. So there's an area underneath, was probably where Jesus was resting. And uh, the area, the platform above where the helmsman would stand there to do his duty, do his work. But then the other Christ would be able to sleep underneath there. So uh, we have this. Uh, in, oh, the epi. This phrase right here. Epi to pros kephalion, kephalion, the uh, on the head cushion or the cushion for the head. Uh, some sort of idea of a pillow, whether this is something that was brought along or was something in the boat that was used as such. Anyway, this is where Jesus is sleeping. His word here for sleeping. This, this idea here, though, uh, sleeping, the structure seems to indicate uh, a continuous action, if you will. It also seems to demonstrate a lack of concern or perhaps a, a lack of urgency on the part of Jesus, which, of course, as you can tell as the text goes on, uh, that's a problem for the disciples. They're very concerned that he's not concerned, if you will. So they ask that question of him. Uh, the, uh, the who may, I can pronounce that, I believe it's right here. Mele soy. Is, is it a care? 
it is a, let's see if I can do this, it is a care to you, isn't it? I mean, you do care, don't you? Obviously, the, this question the disciples are asking, well, they're hopeful that they'll get a positive response. Well, we, we, we assume you, you do care, don't you? And of course, we are going to perish. The apolumetha. Or we're going to die. We're going to perish. It is a care to you, is it? Not we are going to perish. Uh, kind of a, a... It's obvious the disciples are afraid. They believe they're going to die here. Uh, I believe Vels is one who says a present indicative verb, this apolumetha, this uh, indicative verb, present indicative verb conveying a future idea. It's important here, because this is going to make, uh, make a difference here as we look at this parable. It's important to understand that the disciples do believe that Jesus can help them, that he can save them. I mean, they have at least a partial understanding, but I don't think they know, well, obviously don't understand, have a full understanding of who he is. They know some. But they don't know all. And they know enough to believe that he can save them. But who exactly is this in the boat? That will turn out to be the big question. In verse 39 then, we continue on. He, he uh, rebukes the wind. If I can find where it's at there. Verse 39, that would be da, 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 the ep, epimason, ep, epimason, oh, there we go, there we go, and he rebukes the wind, so as he rebukes this wind, now Oh, excuse me, I, I'm, I'm on the wrong here. He rebuked the wind. Here we go. Uh, this rebuking of the wind, thinking ahead too far here, and the waves, is a very strong connection to Psalm 106, verse 9, where the psalm refers to the Lord rebuking the Red Sea. Now remember the Jews are looking for a prophet like Moses, as it speaks of in Deuteronomy 18, and one who would perform great wonders and miracles like Moses did, especially the parting of the Red Sea by the hand of the Lord. So they're looking for this. When we get this, this rebuking of the wind and waves, well, right away we're starting to connect the people back to, to what happens with Moses, at least as the psalm portrays it, Psalm 106. So now we have two imperatives in a row here. It's kind of interesting how, how this is translated or how it, how it can be translated here. And I will find it. I'm having a hard time remembering where I'm at. We need the Seopa uh, Tethemosa. Yeah, there we go. Right here. These are two imperatives. And put together like this, oh, that was very legible. Put together like this, the idea is, um, and I think Vels would translate it, I think he put, shut up, be muzzled, with the idea, and stay that way. So be quiet, be still, doesn't quite as intense as shut up and be muzzled and stay that way. Now there are very many Old Testament examples for this uh, Lord's power over water and, uh, water and wind. Of course, Psalm 106, as we said, but we also have Psalm 65, 7, Psalm, <clears throat> excuse me, Psalm 89, 9, Job 26, 12, Psalm 107, 28, 29. So you have a, a, a rather large body of knowledge or a lot of uh, scripture 
that would be readily available in the mind of the hearers concerning who it is who's in charge of the wind and the waves. It definitely here is an identification of Jesus as Messiah, the Lord God of Israel. So moving on to verse 40 then, the te uh, deloi esta, here we go, this, um, this phrase here, why are you, frequently it's translated, why are you so afraid? You could also do something, why are you cowardly? Why are you acting so fearful? It's a pretty strong rebuke by Jesus of his disciples. Because, you see, because the disciples are the insiders. They've been receiving more and more deeper teaching, as we mentioned with the parables and all that. And yet they're still no better than the others in the crowd. It seems to be the message that Jesus is delivering. They do not truly understand who Jesus is. And that's an ongoing theme for Mark, up through the first eight chapters of Mark, in fact. Do you not have, do you not yet have faith? Do you not yet have faith? Boy, that's, that's a tough one, isn't it? However, I think, um, give a quote from Vells, I think really sums us up pretty well. On the one hand, they certainly appear to have saving faith, for they follow Jesus, they listen to him, they come to him for help, not in significant points. On the other hand, they do not have a faith that rests confidently in Jesus. That's probably a preachable moment there. I'll leave that one up to you. Verse 41 then, continue on with this, uh, they were filled with great fear. It's interesting to see the uh, fear. You know, they had fear, of course, in the face of the wind and the waves. But this fear, in comparison with that fear, it's, it's a fear that demonstrates an understanding of divine saving activity, perhaps. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, as we read in the Old Testament. So they immediately ask, the big question. Who is this? Who then is this? That's the big question here of the text. Who is this guy in the boat? Who is Jesus? On the one hand, he's their teacher and they believe in him, as in saving faith, as Vels mentioned. But when he calms the sea with the word, their fear and their questions show that they do not yet know the full extent of who's in the boat. Human beings do not control wind and waves. Only God does that. It's very clear throughout all scripture. And then Jesus does it. Who is this? And if he is God, why are we here in his present. And we have that whole Leviticus understanding throughout scripture, the, the unholy in the presence of the holy, not necessarily a good thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Note also then that along with Moses and the Red Sea, that connection, there are all these connections to Jonah, his story, the great storm, Jonah asleep in the hold, the sailors questioning why he does not care if they perish. And then the calming of the sea when he's thrown into it. And then, of course, the newfound faith of those pagan soldiers, or sailors, rather. There's, there's several connections there with the Jonah story, so it's kind of interesting to note that. In conclusion, though, it's also possible to preach this, uh, this event, this text, in a, a metaphorical way. The boat being the church, beset by all manners of storms, but in the presence of Jesus, but the presence of Jesus himself 
Then the church calms the waters and the winds and nurtures faith. Now, I am actually preaching on this text, and as I preach the text, my theme will be, who is in the boat? Or in this, I think I might do, who is in this boat? And I'm going to focus upon identity, the identity of Christ, but also then the identity of the church, or the identity the church has because of Christ, and, and go on from there. So, as I preach this, I'll be thinking of you, and I pray that God would bless you also on your preaching.